Well, good morning, and welcome to Grace Valley Christian Center's Adult Sunday School. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we read this morning in John 1 that the true light has come into the world, but men loved darkness. Father, we thank you, O God, for your mighty work of bringing people from darkness into your glorious light. And I pray that as we study this doctrine of regeneration, that you would help each one of us, first and foremost, to make our own calling and election sure. And then secondly, that you would give us a deeper understanding of the mighty work that you have done and a greater appreciation for it and a greater ability to witness to your glory. And so we ask your blessing on this time in Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're beginning a new series this week. We're going to go for four weeks talking about the doctrine of regeneration. And this is what we're going to do. We'll probably only get through point one on the outline this morning and maybe get started on point two. But we're going to look at why the doctrine is important and the context for the doctrine and then the definitions of the term. And then because of that, we'll need to take a look at human nature, total depravity and free will. Then we're going to look at the place of regeneration in the order of salvation or the order of salutis. We're going to look at the nature of regeneration and what leads up to it. And then finally talk about the application and evidence of regeneration. And so we're going to begin with why the doctrine is important. When the Philippian jailer cried out, what must I do to be saved? What was the answer? Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Not, you must be born again. And that's the consistent pattern of the New Testament. In Mark 16, 16, for example, we read, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And in Acts 2, 21, we're told everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in Romans 10, 9, we're told that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So this is the consistent pattern in the scriptures. We don't see in the New Testament anyone being told, you must be born again in answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? So, you know, you might say, well, yeah, okay, I understand we need to be born again, but that is something that happens to us and we don't cooperate in that work. And God's method of performing that work and his reasons for choosing certain individuals are mysteries we can't fathom. And so Deuteronomy 29, 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord our God. So maybe we shouldn't really be all that concerned about speaking about regeneration. Why is it important? So you might ask whether or not this doctrine, this doctrine is important at all. Are we prying into the secret things of God? And the answer is categorically no. For what does it say with the rest of the verse in Deuteronomy 29, 29? The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed to us and our children, right? And new birth, while it is a secret work of God, and it is mysterious, and his reasons for choosing certain people are unknown to us, the work itself is revealed when God causes somebody to be born again, because there is a visible change that must occur in that person's life, and so that work becomes revealed. We're not at all diving into the secret things of God. And I have a list here of reasons that this is important, and this comes from me, not from some great theologian, so you could take it with a grain of salt, perhaps. But I will say that I think these are the most important reasons. It's not an exhaustive list. But why is it important? It's important because it guards against false conversions, and we'll look at that in a moment in more detail. It also causes us to praise and thank God more for this mighty work of salvation that he has done. It encourages us to rely on the gospel and not on some evangelistic methodology. And it's also the ground for true assurance of salvation and a powerful overcoming Christian life. Now, as I said, this is not exhaustive. You could add other things to the list. So, for example, we should pray for revival rather than thinking that we can have revival meetings or something and cause it to happen. But nonetheless, I think this list covers the main points. So. Let's take a look at these. First, it guards against false conversions. Just telling people to pray the sinner's prayer or to accept Jesus runs the very real and serious risk of false conversions. Of course, we must have people pray. We must have people acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. But if that's all we do is that they say that or they pray that and there's nothing more to our teaching, nothing more to the substance of the gospel, 
we run a very serious risk of false conversions. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, but we are not saved by a faith that is alone. And so the doctrine of regeneration makes a number of things clear. First, it makes clear that man is totally depraved and therefore requires a total reformation. We're going to be going through most of these verses later, so I won't look at them in detail now, but look at, you know, Romans 3, 9 through 18, where we're told there is no one righteous, not even one, and it goes on with this universal condemnation of man. And in Romans 7, 18, where Paul himself says that he knows that nothing good lives in his flesh. And so we see that man is, that, that our problem is not just that we need a five-step program for self-improvement or a 10-step program for self-improvement. Our problem is a radical, fundamental problem in our being, the core of our being that we can do nothing about. Sin is like an iceberg. You maybe see 10% of it. Maybe. The 90% that sinks ships is hidden. It's deep within us. The work that needs to be done in us is a deep, radical, fundamental change in the core of our being and it is not something we can do. And that's the second point. Man cannot bring about this radical change through his own effort. And again, Romans 3.11, you can look at John 6.44, of course, says that no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And Romans 6.65 says that no one can come unless the Father enables him. And we'll look at that again in more detail later. A regenerate person is a new creation, we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17, and will therefore live differently. And that's why in Galatians 6.15 it says what counts or what matters is a new creation. The difference between the unregenerate and the regenerate is the difference between darkness and light, between being blind and seeing, between being dead and being alive. I had thought to illustrate that, but I was going to ask if we could somehow blacken the whole room when I got to this slide. I'll just make it go pitch dark and then make it become light again and say, could you tell the difference? Unfortunately, we can't darken this room that quickly and that well, so I chose not to do that. But it's that difference, the stark, it's a stark difference. It's not something hidden. It's true that we can't see into another person's heart. It's true that we don't even understand our own hearts fully. But the difference between somebody who is not born again and somebody who is born again is a stark, visible, obvious difference. And I've got a number of scriptures up here. I've underlined the two I'm going to show you right now. Acts 26, 17 to 18 says, I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. As Pastor has said multiple times, everyone obeys. The only question is who you obey. And then Ephesians 2.5 says, God made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. That's a pretty powerful statement, and we'll again look at that in more detail later. Now, we can't expect perfection, of course. We're not talking about anybody being made perfect in this life, but we must expect the life of God and the soul of man to be evident to others. And again, I've got a list of scriptures you can look at. I'll quote two of them here. Romans 8 9 says, You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And Galatians 4 6 says, Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So again, we see this radical nature of the change that is being spoken of here. This is not just a choice that somebody makes that then causes them to live a little differently, and Jesus Christ is a wonderful example and an encouragement to them. That's not what Christianity is all about. So just as new birth cannot be, just as a birth cannot be kept hidden, so a new birth cannot be kept hidden. 1 Corinthians 4.20 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. And Paul warned, First Timothy, or warned Timothy and us about false believers. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that not sound like a description of the morning newspaper? 
Does that not sound like a description of us in our natural state, if we're honest about it, if we go back and look at what we were like? Having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with them. And I want to point out that having a form of godliness but denying its power, without new birth, we have no power. That list of attributes is the list of all men outside of Christ, and it's still in us to some extent, all of it, of course, but then we also see the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5.21, right? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's a radical change. It's not a small change, and it's not one that we can bring about by ourselves or by any amount of work on our part or the part of any other human being. This has to be a work of God, and it is power. It's not just some self-help program. When we understand the radical nature of our, of our need and God's provision, that we are hell-bound and hell-deserving sinners, so John 3.36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Think about that for a minute, God's wrath eternal, everlasting punishment and hatred from God poured out upon you. That is the state we are in outside of Christ. That is what we deserve. We were hell-bound. We were deserving of hell. We still deserve hell, but praise God, He doesn't give us what we deserve. So when we see that, and then we see that we could not on our own do anything to gain salvation, and so again, Showing just one of the verses I've got listed here, John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And we'll look at that in more detail in a later session, but the Greek word there for draw is talking about dragging by force. It's not talking about coercing a little bit or encouraging or wooing or anything like that. And so when we see those two things, and we also see that God graciously saved us by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 1 18 and 19, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Our salvation was costly. If there had been another way for God to remain just and the one who justifies those who do something, he would have done it in some other way. He would not have sent His own Son to bear the wrath of God and to pay the punishment on the cross for us if there had been some other simpler, easier way. But He did. Christ prayed, Christ prayed, if it is possible, may this cup be removed from me. Well, we know that Christ's prayers are always efficacious, so had it been possible, it would have been done. Had there been another way, if righteousness could come through the law, God would not have had to send His Son. We need to think about how painful, how costly this was, how deep the problem was. And when we recognize those things, then we will be motivated to praise and thank Him all the more for His marvelous salvation, and we'll join with the psalmist, amazing grace, not the psalmist, <laughs> but the hymn writer, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. This should bring great praise and joy and thanksgiving from us as God's children. And then it also encourages us to rely on the gospel, not evangelistic methodology. Romans 1.16 says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, which what? Means what? I'm proud of the gospel, because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And note especially the word power there. The gospel is not an invitation. It's not just a suggestion. It's not just an offer. If it were any of those things, no man would ever be saved. But when the effectual call comes, it comes with power, and people are saved. Jesus Christ did not come to make salvation possible. If He had only come to make it possible, and then we had to do something, we would all be going to hell. Christ came to save. So we can never bring anyone to faith by the power of our arguments. In 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2, Paul says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
we must pray and expect God to work. Only He can cause someone to be born again, and He can use the most pathetic presentation of the gospel you can possibly imagine. The power does not depend, is not, does not come from you or from me. The power comes from God. And yet, how can anyone believe unless they have heard? How can they hear unless someone is sent? You know, we must preach the gospel. We must tell people about Jesus Christ, but then God must do the work. And also, the doctrine of regeneration gives us the true ground for assurance, understanding that our new life in Christ is based on an irreversible, monergistic work of God frees us from the fear of failing. The fact that I will one day enter heaven is not because I'm a good person, and it's not because I am going to be faithful in my own strength. It's not because I'm going to do anything. It's in spite of me. It's because God does a mighty work in regenerating me, and then God does a mighty work in preserving me and bringing me all the way. It's not me that I depend on, it's God that I depend on. So it fears us from the, frees us from the fear of failing. It energizes and encourages us to live by the Spirit's power for the glory of God. We don't live in our own strength, and we'll look at some scriptures in a second here. And finally, it encourages us to engage in a healthy self-examination to make our calling and election sure rather than a morbid introspection wondering whether or not we're good enough. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more too because I think it's maybe the most important point. So, our salvation is secure because it ultimately depends on God, not on us. In John 6, 39, we read, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Praise God. That is the will of God the Father. That is the will that is going to prevail. And it doesn't depend fundamentally on my efforts, although my efforts had better be there, or my claim to being born again is not true. Philippians 1, 6, of course, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The foundation of our confidence is not in us. It is in God and his work. And 1 Peter 1, 5, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. This is God's work from beginning to end, and therein lies our confidence. Also, we aren't born again, nor do we live our life by our own strength. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. That's the source of our power, the Holy Spirit of God. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. It's God working in us, but we have to work out. So there's this symmetry, there's a symmetry, if you will, here, although it's not very symmetric. Uh, God works in us, which is his mighty power, and then we do our feeble little bit of whatever we can to work it out. And then 2 Timothy 1.7, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. And I have some other scriptures here you can look at. By the way, all of this is going to be on the web, so. And then this may be the single most important point, as I mentioned a minute ago. If you do not understand the radical, monergistic nature of regeneration, you can get endlessly caught up in looking at yourself not to see whether you have been saved, but to see if you're good enough to be saved. And I can answer that question for you. You're not, and I'm not, and nobody is. So this leads to either pride or despair. This this kind of morbid introspection about whether or not I'm good enough. Oh man, you know. and I've seen Christian people who claim to be Christians that I know who worried about this all the time. And you know, you might think, oh, that's very pious and wonderful. They're worried about their salvation. No, it's not pious and wonderful because they weren't worried about whether they had been saved. They were worried about whether they were doing enough or they were good enough. And, and as I said, the answer is no, you're not, and you haven't. But 2 Peter 1.10 says, therefore, my brothers, be all the more eager to do what? To make your calling and the election sure. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, and it doesn't mean you're good enough, but it means you see evidence of God having worked regeneration in your life and you see evidence of him continuing to work in your life and leading you, and you see evidence of him bringing you into a deeper and a deeper sense of your own sin and repentance for it, 
and a turning to God, and it's a continual process throughout all of life. Now, the Old Testament was clear in teaching that we cannot save ourselves. We need, we need our sins to be atoned for, and we need to have new hearts. We need a radical change in our inner being. And again, I've got a list of scriptures you can look at. I'll, I'll look at one of them, 44, Isaiah 44, 20. He feeds on ashes. A deluded heart misleads him. He cannot save himself or say, is not this thing in my right hand a lie? Speaking about the idols that, we, that the person just made out of wood. They use part of it for a fire to warm themselves, and, and then part of it they bow down and worship to. And we all have idols as well. And our modern age has many, many idols, and we need to throw them out. We can't trust in them. It's also clear, and the Old Testament is clear in teaching that God himself will save his people and that he will send a Messiah to save them. And again, I've got a list of scriptures you can look at, but Jeremiah 33, 30, uh, 31, 33, and 34 says, This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Our sins will be separated from us as far as the east is from the west. They'll be buried in the depths of the sea. No one will ever find them. A search will be made, but they won't be found. This is glorious. This is wonderful, but it's the work of God. So this is why Jesus spoke the way he did to Nicodemus. He was a teacher, but he did not understand these things, and Christ rebuked him for that. And I want to look at this passage and then make some points about it because it's an important passage. This is where, of course, the main place you see when you, when you think about when you think about being told about being born again was Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. But it wasn't in response to a question, what must I do to be saved? So let's look at the passage. We'll just read it first and then make some comments. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you're doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you did not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that, everywhere, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is a marvelous passage, and we could spend several weeks just on this passage, but I want to make a few points from it. Note, first notice that Nicodemus knew that Jesus was a teacher who came from God. He had properly understood the significance of the miracles. There was something going on in this man, and we know that later Nicodemus came to faith. Do you remember that he was one of the two who came and took the body of Jesus down and buried it? All right, so, so we know Nicodemus came to faith. God was drawing him, I would say, at this point. We'll talk more about that later. But he was too puffed up with himself to risk being seen, and therefore he came at night. He was worried about losing his position. He was a member of the ruling council, a man of power and influence. Well, Christ saw that the basic problem with Nicodemus was his pride. So he spoke to the heart issue. We must be born again. We must be regenerated. Nicodemus never asked, what must I do? But, you know, Christ answered the pride issue. You can't do anything. And you're being a member of the ruling council, it doesn't matter, it doesn't mean anything. In fact, you're condemned because you don't understand. You're Israel's teacher, and you don't understand these things? It's in the Old Testament. It wrote about me, and you didn't understand it. 
And notice when he says to see the kingdom of God, that means to enter the kingdom of God, to be born again, to be saved, to be sent, to be going to heaven. And Christ notes the mysterious working of the Holy Spirit in regeneration. He said the wind blows wherever it pleases. You know, a metaphor that has a very clear image to us. You can see the effects of the wind, but you don't see the wind itself. And then he says that the Son of Man, which is a clear reference, of course, to Daniel's vision in Daniel 7, has come and that he must be lifted up for people to receive eternal life. Salvation is of God, and salvation was costly. All right, we've made it to the second point on the outline, so we're getting a little, I guess I must be speaking too quickly. <laughs> Hard for me to imagine that. Uh, so we're on the second point, the context for the doctrine. I think it's important when we consider regeneration to not just consider regeneration all by itself, but to see it in the context of God's overall plan for salvation. So to understand it, we, as I just said, we need to see it as a part of his overall plan. His purpose is the manifestation of his own glory, of course. That's his ultimate purpose. But how does he achieve that? Well, he accomplishes it through creation, fall, and redemption. Creating people in his own image, allowing the fall, and then planning and providing for the redemption of his elect to be made holy and blameless in his sight and to be brought into his presence for all eternity, his treasured possession, his segula. What a glorious result this is. What a glorious plan this is. It's all for God's glory, all glory to him, but we're the tre we get tremendous benefit from this. I can, you can't imagine anything more than what we get from this. So God's plan of redemption takes place as a part of his covenant with his people. And the heart of the covenant is that I will be their God and they will be my people. And so we, again, we have to understand all of this in the context of a covenant relationship of God with his people. He doesn't deal with this. He does deal with this individually, but he doesn't deal with this primarily as individuals. He deals with this as a part of the body of Christ, as a part of the bride of Christ, as a member of his church, as one of his redeemed people. It's a relationship with, with more than just one person, and we always need to view it that way, and we always need to think about it that way in order to have a proper understanding of our own salvation. It's not just for me. God didn't save me for me. You know, my good was not his ultimate aim in all of this. I benefit tremendously from it and praise God for that, but that's not his ultimate aim in all of this. It's not about me, and it's not about you. It's about God, but then there's the people of God, the bride of Christ, and we have to see ourselves as part of that. And the heart of the covenant, and, and so to be God's people, we must be radically changed. Hebrews 12, 14 says, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And we should, again, stop there and think for a minute. You know, we, we tend to read over a verse like that and just blow on by and move ahead. But stop and think about Isaiah's vision of God, the greatest vision in the Old Testament, arguably, although maybe you could quote Moses, but most people would say that, Isaiah. And what was his response when he saw the throne room of God? Oh, he fell down, I'm, I'm undone. I'm, I'm disintegrating, I'm falling apart, I'm being torn to pieces because I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a sinner. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have beheld absolute holiness and purity. And we need to realize that's what God's ultimate purpose for us is. If we're going to come into his presence in heaven, we don't need a little tiny bit of moral reformation. I don't know about you, because I don't know your hearts as well as I know my own, but I don't need a little bit of moral reformation. I need a complete and total thoroughgoing redoing, revision, change in every bit of my being in order to be able to stand in the glorious presence of God and His holiness and not be undone. But on that day, we will not only not be undone, we will rejoice and enjoy His presence and spend eternity with Him. What a glorious thing that is. But we need to see how radical the need is. And this radical change begins, proceeds, ends, and is based on our union with Christ. Our salvation has to be understood in that context. Ephesians 1.4 says, For he chose us in him, meaning in Christ, before the creation of the world 
to be holy and blameless in his sight. And that should blow your minds. Before this universe ever existed, before God ever called any of it into being, he had you in mind. He had you as one of his chosen people out of a race of sinful, fallen human beings who had rebelled against him. He had you in mind. Is that not just amazing? It blows my mind to think about that. And 2 Timothy 1.9 says, God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. So it was in Christ. It wasn't given to us, just given to us. It was in Christ. We were viewed in Christ as part of the body of Christ in union with him. Again, everything is done in union with Christ and our salvation. That's an amazing thing. That's why when we went through Redemption Accomplished and Applied by John Murray, remember, and he gave the Ordo Salutis, you know, people put union with Christ in different places in the Ordo Salutis. I don't even have it in the one I'll show in another lecture or two. But it, it, it undergirds the whole Ordo Salutis. It's the whole thing is in union with Christ. So you can't put it in any one spot necessarily. The whole thing is in union with Christ. What a great privilege this is, the apex of our privilege. And regeneration is the first step in our personal experience of the transformation God has planned in eternity to make us holy and blameless. We are active after regeneration, but not in regeneration. And just by way of comment, nor are we active in being made perfect when we die, nor are we active in receiving our resurrection bodies. So you can think of a little graph, if you will, you know, of, of holiness or, or, or whatever you want to call it, godliness on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. And, you know, before our regeneration, I don't know what that graph is doing, but it's not pretty. And then at regeneration, there's this, there's this step change. It's not just a little slope. It's not something we do over a period of time. No, there's a step change. God causes us to be born again. And then, you know, we live our lives in sanctification. We're going up and down and up and down, hopefully more up than down. And then we die, and God perfects us. That's another step change. And then after that, I'm not sure how to draw the graph again, but then when Christ comes again, we receive a resurrection body, and that's another step change. There's three points in that graph where we have nothing to do in it. We have nothing at all to do with it. So God's greatest work is the building of his church, the bride of Christ, all of the elect are regenerated to be a part of the church, which is the family of God, his adopted children. And you can look at Ephesians 1.5 and 1 Peter 4.17. We're also individually the temple of the Holy Spirit, and together we're being built into a house, right? Into a holy house. So you can, you know, together we're sort of the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can look at 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 1 Peter 2.5. We're told we're a royal priesthood, a holy nation in 1 Peter 2.5. And of course, we're called the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 27 and elsewhere. So again, this idea of corporate unity, this idea that we are a part of something much larger than ourselves, it's not about me. And we should see our individual regeneration in this broader context of God's plan, which views all of us together as his treasured possession, the bride of Christ. Unity and community are vitally important. And we are to reflect the glory of God, who is triune. So in, in reflecting his glory, he couldn't arguably do it in a single person. There's the triune nature of God, and so in reflecting his glory, there's also the corporate nature of mankind. And of course, in this life, we have marriage and family and so forth. You can make those connections. But, but the point is that we need to see ourselves as a part of something much greater. And Hebrews 11, 39 to 40 says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them, speaking about the roll call of faith here, the roll, none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. So somehow, ultimately, our perfection is not individual. Our perfection is corporate. You may not like that because it means you're made perfect with me, which I can understand that being a problem. But, but our perfection is corporate. We are made perfect together and together with all of the saints from all the past, all as the bride of Christ. And God will have a holy, perfect, 
glorious bride for Christ, without stain or blemish or wrinkle, but perfect in every way. What a glorious picture that is. And so, with that, we'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your astounding work of regeneration. And we pray, O oh God, that you would help us to have a greater and a deeper appreciation for what you have done in each of our lives individually, that you would give us a greater sense of the importance of declaring Christ to others, that you would give us, O oh Lord God, your Holy Spirit to guide us each and every step of the way, that we would be busy each day putting our own sin to death and putting on righteousness, that we might work hard to be holy and blameless in your sight, but then we would live entirely in thankful obedience for all that you have done for us and for who you are. And we ask your blessing on this day, Lord. May the word that is preached go forth with your Holy Spirit power, that some here today would be regenerated, O oh God. And we pray that you would be pleased with our worship, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.